Thank you everyone so much for joining us at the Nonprofit Show. And we have an amazing conversation today with a really special guest that we're happy to have back on. Uh, getting the best from your best, managing and moving up superstars with Miriam Dix. Uh, so we're excited to get going and we'll we have a lot to cram into this 30 minutes. So uh, don't need to wait anymore. And I'm Mitch Stein. I'm one of our rotating co-hosts here at the Nonprofit Show. I'm the head of strategy at Chariot, which is a donor advised fund solution for nonprofits. And you can see here on the screen, we have an amazing panel of co-hosts that you'll see every day rotating in and out. And today I'm joined by Sherry Quam taylor So excited to be back here with you, Sherry. Hey, Mitch, how are you? I'm so good. I'm so nice to see you both again. Yeah, great, and... great to be on. This This is our, our threesome, our, our uh, dynamite group here. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Well, and we want to give a big shout out uh, per usual to our amazing presenting sponsors. And I'm going to start with Miriam uh, right there in the middle. Uh, thanks. Big thank you to, to 180 Management Group. Also Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Inc., uh, Fundraising Academy, National University, Your Part-Time Controller, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and The Nonprofit Show. Thanks so much for your support. So Miriam, uh, we're not strangers, but uh, we're, we're just getting to know your work, which has been so um, just awesome to hear your expertise and your, your leadership in this area. Um, set us up a bit uh, about what we're going to be talking about today and, and talk to us a little bit about 180 Management Group and, and by introducing yourself. Sure. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name again is Miriam Dix, and I'm the owner of 180 Management Group. We are a management consulting firm. Um, we serve uh, clients in the mission-driven space. So whether that's nonprofit organizations, healthcare organizations, faith-based institutions, and even, believe it or not, some small businesses are mission-driven. And uh, we provide transformational services as coaching, consulting, um, contracted type services, custom events, as well as curriculum and coursework for those who need training. And um, we've been doing that work for the last 10 years and excited to be doing that. One thing that we do encounter often is the need to have professional development come up as part of a strategy, um, especially as it relates to uh, leaders who are uh, doing the work, but maybe not in the best position to do the work um, and maybe not support it like they need to, and maybe even doing the work without the title. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. And so, you know, we, we, we often find that there are some hidden gems within the organization and they are superstars. Mm -hmm. They are in their own right. And so how is it that we can really be good stewards over the talent that we have? We in the nonprofit space specifically, it is, it is a hard, um, it's hard enough in the job market trying to attract talent. So what are we doing to really retain talent so that we are keeping our institutional knowledge and that we're providing opportunities for those who are doing the work and doing it so well to really be recognized and to be stewarded well. So that's what we're talking about today, how it is that we are going to um, manage and lead and provide those uh, that upward mobility for our superstars. I love this topic. And I just think people, what can be more interesting than people? And that's what the sector is all about. And I agree with you that we don't spend enough time talking about how to provide the best, uh, the best operating environment for our people and make sure they're su succeeding. I'd love to kick off this conversation, Miriam, by just even helping folks better understand how they identify someone as a superstar. Help us, uh, understand that term better and what are some best practices to make sure that you're cultivating those kinds of people in your organization? Well, you know, I think the best place to start is really taking inventory, uh, being very intentional about saying, what does it take to succeed here, to, to be successful? Because every organization undoubtedly has their own culture, uh, their own way of, of being excellent. And you can't just make it cookie cutter to say that this is what excellence looks like when your organization operates totally different from another organization. So I'd start with how is it and what does it take to succeed here? 
Because when you can identify mm -hmm. those characteristics, those qualities um, that you would see in a person who is successful in your organization, then you can really identify the superstars. Mm -hmm. Because those people, the superstars, are going to excel beyond others in those areas, right? So then it's not so um, subjective, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is is can be a little tricky, right? Because yeah. if we don't have some kind of rubric, we can't say that this is what it takes to succeed in our organization or to excel here. Um, then it's just a subjective conversation about who who seems to be doing better than others. Yeah. And so, what is the rubric? Like, what should the rubric entail um, that says this is what a successful person is going to look like in our organization? And then, how do we assess that? Is it that we have some sort of scale? Is it that there's some sort of metric that says that this person is going above and beyond? Uh, and that's how we can make sure we're identifying these folks who are doing great work and exceeding and excelling in all areas. Wow. Miriam, I worked for a company one time um, and their, their uh, leadership's approach was really uh, how do we find that number two, like almost like train your replacement kind of mm -hmm, attitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, wow, someone with an ego, that would be a difficult issue of like, wait, I, I don't want to uh, train my re uh, replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like that's what you're talking about. It's like um, we, you know, having leadership really uh, identify what are those metrics? What are we watching for? And then ego aside, let's let's grow, let's identify, let's develop that that person. Um, I don't know if you agree with that approach, but I uh, talked about developing and, and growing those people once we have identified them, um, ego or not, right? Actually, we think about succession planning only for the ED, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and but there are so many positions that within the organization that if someone left the organization, whether they retired or whether they found another opportunity, if they left the organization, there would be a vacancy there that yeah. would be hard to fill because we haven't really assessed what that person, sometimes the person brought to the role, mm -hmm. um, which may have expanded the role, extended the role, and we have not taken that into account so that we aren't well able to fill the position once it, that person has vacated it. And so when we think about succession planning, we really should be thinking about what makes the role successful mm -hmm. and what have they brought to the role since they began that then that particular position. Because nine out of 10 of the times, people bring so much oh. to the work that they do, and we're not capturing that. And so when we think about you know, developing and growing our superstar talent, we really should be checking in to see what's on their plate. Yes, yes. <laughs> because I, just, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with folks that said, well, when I, when I ask about their job description, if it's current, They'll, you know, 90% of the time it's like, well, you know, when I was hired, <laughs> totally. the role was this, but it has evolved and really I'm doing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that by itself says that you have a superstar because yeah. they are flexible. They are adaptable. They are, you know, picking up the pieces and making eager, them, right? They are mm -hmm. eager um, and, and they are probably dependable, right? Which yeah. is how they end up getting all the work. And so when you think about it that way, yes, succession planning is a really good opportunity uh, to really, you know, develop and grow talent Yeah, just because you're assessing what they're doing and what they're bringing to the table um, while they're in that role. But one thing I will say about um, developing talent is this. If you find that someone is operating at a high capacity, um, they are, you know, sort of checking off all the the buckets or the the boxes on your list for, you know, what it looks like to really succeed here and excel here. Don't give your best people your worst problems. Mm. Ooh, I, that that's the headline of the show right there. Yeah, <laughs> I hear you I felt on that. that in my bones. <laughs> yeah, don't, just, do not. Yeah. Whatever you do, don't give your best people your worst problems because so what you're doing is telling them subconsciously that we're not setting you up for success. We're setting you up for failure. Mm. It's almost like giving them the impossible job. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that's the quickest way to douse the fire of someone who is energetic, re you know, ready to go, want to bring something to the table is to give them the impossible job. Mm -hmm. Or, or I would, I would just say Miriam too, like how it's framed. So if, if, if you want to give them a really difficult challenge, frame it as like, we haven't been able to solve this yet. If you can help us make progress on it, that's a win. 
as opposed to, oh, this is great. Like, this is such a great opportunity. And you're like kind of masking it with that rosy language. I think that's also really demotivating. Mm. Yeah. And even let's say you've been there for a while. Oh, give it to so-and-so. They'll take care of it. Yeah. Give it to so-and-so. They'll figure it out. And just the the taxing uh, and the the weight even this, yeah. the weight of having to really be the person, the go to person to handle all the things that no one else wants or that's too complex supposedly for other people. Mm -hmm. It just comes on your your plate for you to address. Uh, it just really burns out those who are would otherwise be the best and the brightest yeah. uh, to really lead the organization into the future. I feel like there is that fine line um, and I've felt it in roles of like, we don't want to be taken advantage of, right? And set up mm -hmm. for for failure. But there is that line, which we started with by saying, and, and I tell my own daughters this thing, like, be eager. If someone says, will you do this? And it is above your job description. Yes, mm -hmm. is the answer. So I feel like there is this fine line of wanting to be eager and wanting to show that you want to grow in your role, but also watching that you're not being taken advantage of or not being paid fairly because now your role is uh, is three people's job description, but maybe the salary hasn't changed. And I, I like what Mitch said about framing it, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, let's say it is a problem that we have faced or that, you know, um, we are you know, really struggling to to figure out what is the expectation for the yeah. person that you're giving that particular situation or challenge to. Uh, because when you set the appropriate expectations, then it's different from, you know, solve the problem. Right. So what are, maybe there's some milestones, maybe there are some benchmarks, maybe there's just some progress, right, that we want to note. Um, that's going to get us closer to where we want to be. But having an idea of what is the what are the outcomes mm -hmm. that you're expecting this person to be able to um, to be able to bring to the table. Uh, and so definitely let's be thinking about what it is, what kind of work we're asking someone to do, yeah. regardless of whether they're, you know, um, the next COO or the next executive director or whoever, but be very um, intentional about knowing what you're asking someone to do and the costs mm. that you're asking them to take. Yeah. Time and money, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> And Miriam, in this topic of, of growing and developing superstar talent in the nonprofit setting in particular, Sherry and I were both bringing up examples of former jobs we've had outside of the nonprofit sector. I know you work with both for-profit and nonprofit businesses. I know leaders of nonprofits are getting advice from board members who have way more experience in the for-profit side. Do you have any good like examples of how this differs or is unique to the nonprofit sector? What, anything about professional development and growing and developing your superstars that is specific to nonprofit work that you could share? Hmm. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I will say that in my experience, having worked in the nonprofit sector, as well as in the for-profit corporate side of the house, that leadership development, um, especially in larger organizations, is a part of the fabric of the organization. Mm -hmm. In other words, there may be in-house leadership development programs, workforce mm -hmm. development programs right. in-house, where you know we say we want to make sure that there's training available for anyone who is interested in being a leader. Um, but we have, you know, we can identify who those folks are and invite them to the training. <laughs> Not that you know we get to self, you know, select. <laughs> <laughs> say, right. I don't want to be the leader, so I'm going to go to the <laughs> to the next training. Yeah, but, there she is um, again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, she's coming. Yeah. No, but but in the nonprofit space, a lot of that's done externally, if at all. Mm -hmm. I don't really see a lot of in house. Uh, and when I say leadership development, I mean, what does it take for you to be promoted here? What's the trajectory? What do you need to you know accomplish as far as your performance evaluations are concerned? How what's the track the track look like? Um, it's sort of a sometimes last man standing approach. Mm -hmm. You know, you've outlasted all the other marketing directors, so now you get to be you know the VP of marketing. <laughs> 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 sometimes it's just you know, well, we we don't have upward mobility, so we're just going to title change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, you know, so, so I, you don't see a lot of that where, you know, the dynamics, especially the structure of the organization org chart changes yeah. to help to produce that upward mobility from a leadership yes. perspective. 
you don't really see that on the other side in other yeah. environments. And so then it can come across as though leaders aren't prepared. Mm -hmm. So because you have a COO role or a VP role in this organization, are you actually prepared to be a VP or a C mm -hmm. in a C -suite position anywhere else? Yeah. And so, you know, just the intentionality about leadership, the uh, intentionality, well, the intentionality about selecting leaders and developing leaders is sort of hit and miss from mm -hmm. what I can see, um, having been on both sides of the house. Yeah, I see that. And I, I think the intentionality also starts with, well, let's actually put it in the budget that we would train our leaders, that we would invest. And it's not a um, well, everybody gets $500 to do some trick. No, no, no. Oh God, this yeah. this is a significant part of your organization's growth and should be a growth initiative. So that's resonating with me, Miriam, of just the intentionality of doing it, but also the me mechanics of is it in the budget and is it a uh, is it a, a sizable en enough amount that it actually is going to drive growth and get us to the end result? And then the third part is, does it match our strategic initiatives? Mm. Wild so, concept. <laughs> I, a, I know it should be, but yes. I know. I hear you. Um, I hear you. I had a conversation not too long ago with an ED about leadership development and you know what was uh, the the plan or if there was a process for it or if there's a you know policy or procedure around it. And it's like no, but I did at least get it into the budget this year. So now we you know have about five hundred dollars per person, right? And I'm thinking, and, and I'm thinking, okay, so how do you leverage that? Is it then that you know that your organization has some needs that are not met and that you can use those resources to help develop your staff in those areas mm -hmm. that will help to increase your chances of meeting your strategic objectives? Or is it just based on, in some cases, based on the, the employee saying, oh, well, I'd like to be a better speaker. Well, if you're not speaking mm -hmm. for the organization, is that the best use of our resources for your professional development? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so just making sure that even if it's budgeted, we're budgeting it for something that is going to move the organization forward. Yes. Because at the end of the day, we all are bringing something to the table to make this organization better. Uh, and if we can coordinate our efforts <laughs> in our development, then how much better can we be? Yeah, so good. Yeah, and I obviously you've alluded to it a few times, but I just want to go a little bit deeper on moving talent up and, and that either that succession planning or helping people understand what are the benchmarks you achieve to move to those next levels. Talk to us a bit about how you move talent up when there is typically pretty limited opportunity within any one organization. So, you know, I'd say start with um, when you have, let me back up to say this, it's important to have uh, performance evaluations that are tied to job descriptions. <laughs> I know that could be a foreign concept, but it really works well if you say that this is your role and these are the expectations for your role mm -hmm. so that when you are performing your responsibilities, we can then say you're meeting our expectation or not, yeah. right? So just streamline, can we develop job descriptions um, and performance evaluations that go hand in hand? When we have those job descriptions and performance evaluations that go hand in hand, we can then recognize when someone um, is uh, is maybe exceeding the goals so often that maybe we need a new plan for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love that person. <laughs> right? Uh, so, so maybe they are outgrowing is what we're getting to, outgrowing the role as it stands because they're always exceeding the benchmarks. Um, and that is a great place to be a good problem to have. Um, but if there's no way of um, identifying what that next step is going to be, then there's a problem. Mm -hmm. So I'd always say, you know, during that annual performance evaluation, and even as a new hire, it's actually the best place to have this. As a new hire, ask, what are your goals and how can we help you meet them here? Yeah. Because then you might find that there are some goals that they have for their career that doesn't require them to have a new role or a yeah. new position. Maybe mm -hmm. they're leading an affinity group for the organization. Mm 
Maybe they're sitting on boards. Maybe they're representing the organization in some other capacity um, that you know uh, uh, it appeals to their development, but it's also a good opportunity for the organization. Yeah. So can we identify these opportunities to meet the needs of our and our superstars when they're sort of outgrowing the role that they have if we don't have another role for them? And then yeah. I'll put this caveat in. Don't be selfish. Mm. <laughs> it's so easy to just be selfish when it comes to, but but there's such a good, you know, so-and-so, this is the role. Yeah. Is, they do it so well. Yeah. We want to have them here forever. We don't want to let them go. You can suffocate someone like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so we can't be selfish. Maybe we have to at some point say, um, is there anything else that if we can't do it here, how can we help you grow? Mm -hmm. And even that means somewhere else, because I promise you that comes back to you. People want to work for you when they know that you are you have their best interest in mind. Well, and that person, <laughs> yeah, and that person leaving is going to help you find a great person Mm -hmm. either actively help you like be, by recommending or just like by telling people they had a great experience that's going to draw more people to the organization versus the inverse is also true if you try to hold on to people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you know it's it, as painful as it sounds if you create a culture that celebrates your superstars mm -hmm. superstars will be attracted to you yeah and so if you find that you've run out of options <laughs> <laughs> you've given them all of the, you know, uh, uh, upward mobility that you can within the roles that are available in your org chart or in your organization. And you've given them this flexibility to have other types of ancillary uh, opportunities to, you know, um, sort of scratch those professional itches yeah. and exhausted all of that, then it might be time for them to move on. Mm -hmm. And what does it say about you and your organization that you help someone who outgrew your organization find that next level, find that next organization to really plug in? Because whoever they end up working for is one going to want to support you, right? It creates that partnership yeah. and that dynamic. And then the person who is who you've helped to get to that next level, as you said, Mitch, will want to help, you know, backfill that position for you. Mm -hmm. And when when people know you for that. <laughs> that you are the champion, you champion your employees, you, in, you are the champion for your staff, guess what? Yeah. You won't have problems filling vacancies. It's attractive, right? Mm -hmm. Miriam, what about the flip side of that where uh, it might be a superstar, but perhaps they aren't hitting their goals every year because they, maybe they don't have the support system. Back to the budget, you know, sometimes I think we find superstars, but then we think they're magicians too. And it's like figure out how to do it without proper staffing, without proper resources. What's the flip side of that where uh, a superstar is there, but they're just so weighed down by the day to day and not having the resources? And I think that's, that speaks directly to burnout. Right. Yeah, so right. You have a superstar who's not shining. There's a reason they're not shining. Mm -hmm. And I am a firm believer that if we aren't checking in with our people to see how they're doing and, you know, once a year at your performance evaluation is not enough right. to, you know, really understand how people are faring in their roles. Right. We need to have some sort of or at least quarterly that we're just saying, hey, do you have all the tools you need to do your job? Yes. Um, or is there anything I can do to support you? Um, has there any have, have there been any changes that have unfairly uh, or at least disproportionately impacted your role? Mm -hmm. um, I won't see, say unfairly because then I open up a can of worms, but disproportionately <laughs> affected your role. <laughs> it's a good phrase. Um, and so, you know, so that you're having these check ins to see if people are drowning. Yeah. Because we don't want to wait until we have a performance evaluation to find out someone was drowning for half mm -hmm. the year. Um, and so I think that what, when you find that superstars, superstars are not shining, it's because we haven't done our due diligence in yeah. checking in with them and supporting them along the way. One of the words you use that is just sticking with me so much is champion. Like I love that as a just like a North Star of anyone that's managing people is being a champion for your people. And it what I'm picking up from this conversation is that communication is the single best way to champion mm -hmm. someone. Having that two-way street, intentionality, regularity, and it all comes down to communication. 
Yeah. You know, and I would add to that communication is a big part of being a champion, you know, championing someone else um, into, you know, in, in their role, but, and not, but also being the model. Mm. So not a do as I say, not as I do mm -hmm. kind of situation. So if I say, you know, as a leader that we value these attributes, I also need to show them and embody those attributes. Because what that does is when I have a superstar, they're not out there on an island by themselves saying, oh, that's the goody two shoes. She, mm -hmm. she does every, or he does everything right. And they're an outlier. No, I'm modeling behavior because I'm championing that behavior so that the superstars don't feel isolated, um, that they have the support that this is okay behavior, <laughs> yes. um, which helps to change culture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so along the lines of that, you know, we also have to model what it is that we all, we, we um, believe are excellent behaviors. Well, that's just another definition of champion, right? Is you yourself are being the champ, like you're, you know, also exactly. doing a great, also doing a great job in modeling that to people. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's and I would think less competition in the workplace then too, you know, when everybody is rowing in the same direction and it's not, that's the darling in the office, you know, where it's like, no, this is, this is our culture. Mm -hmm. um, everybody is to be, you know, striving and, and knows what to strive toward. You know, that's the concept that we use in the change management world, the change champion. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if we, you know, have an initiative that we want to implement within our organization, we have to have someone in that change champion role that's going to go out and um, uh, a be able to get others um, to want to, you know, follow along and follow behind right. and, and come alongside the uh, initiative to make it work. And so someone who is, you know, compelling, someone who um, can draw people to them, yeah. uh, someone's charismatic sometimes. They motivating. Can be motivating. Thank you. Mm. They can be a great change champion. Yes. Um, and people will follow because they want to, you know, they make it look like this, the, the thing to do. They're vision casters, right? Visionaries. And so we, we also, when it comes to our superstars, if we can... Uh, be those change champions, change agents within our own organizations, it's a lot easier for others to want to follow suit. Yeah. I. What are, um, when you see nonprofit leaders that are modeling this behavior well and, and that they're lifting up um, superstars, do you have any, like a quick example of just something you've seen where this happened and you loved it or a, maybe a client or just an organization you admire that does this well? I, do, I am thinking of about a particular um, COO of an organization I've worked with who was trying to make sure that um, in their org chart, org structure, they really had a lot of senior leaders and frontline staff, not necessarily a lot of middle managers. And so they needed to sort of develop their leadership team to be able to support other layers of management mm -hmm. and front staff. And so she was modeling what it looked like to delegate mm -hmm. <laughs> and to Huge. have confidence in the people that were being, you know, getting the, the uh, delegated work, right? And so then it made the leaders, her leaders that reported to her more confident in delegating work because of the confidence she had in them that they could do it. And yeah. so then they could exude that same confidence in their staff um, so that they would be able to, you know, delegate work and feel as though it would get done and not, you know, you know how it is sometimes when you really don't want to delegate something because you feel like it's not going to get done. And then you're like, <laughs> yeah. it's about work. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> yeah. And so modeling that was the game changer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Miriam, thank you so much for this great conversation uh, what a valuable thing for people to think about today and this week, uh, how they're helping their teams and supporting their superstars. So just really appreciate, appreciate you joining us. And Sherry, do you want to give some sure. shout outs here just before we wrap up? Final shout out to Bloomring, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Fundraising Academy, National University, uh, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit te Tech Talk, and the nonprofit show. Thanks so much for your sponsorship and your partnership.
Yeah, thank you, everybody. And thanks, everyone, for joining. From all of us at The Nonprofit Show, please stay well so you can do well. We'll see you here tomorrow.